things I, a little background. This is the middle of the story. Uh, the story is called Redemption. It's 1967. There are three characters. Jay and father are motorcy motorcycling down on two BSA Hornets that were loaned to them. And they're, um, they're making a journey from Corvallis, Oregon to Monterey. They're heavy into the Jesus movement, and uh, this is a mission. They decided to travel without any money or any uh, packed clothes with the idea of going up to people and asking them for money and maybe engaging in some spiritual conversation. The third character is Alan, who is father's, um, going to be wife's brother, who's heavy into conservative Christianity and in selling vitamins under a title called Mega One. Alan waited until Father and Jay came closer before he showed them. Slowly he pulled a sword from its curved black case, which looked like polished ebony, but was actually plastic. This was given to me by one of the founders of Mega One just last week at a leadership conference in Phoenix. It means I'm a powerful warrior. He brought the handle to his nose, sword parallel to the ground, and pointed at Father's chest, never taking his eyes from the silver blade. Once it was at the level of his nose, elbow raised up high behind, he slowly raised his other arm and simultaneously began to crouch forward. He then immediately jerked up to his toes and cut the air with a large X. He lowered onto his heels, breathing heavily, and pointed the tip of the sword at Father's forehead. He held it there for seconds. Father looked at Alan and Jay looked at Father. Both were trying to keep from laughing. Father knew that if he looked for even one second at Jay, they were done for. Alan slowly lowered the sword and turned it so that the tip was facing skywards, then brought it close to his body and laid it against his chest, closed his eyes, and took a deep breath. When he opened his eyes, he looked first at Father, then Jay, returned to Father, and smiled. He nodded his head and brought the sword down, slowly slid it back into its shiny black case. Inside, I'm a warrior. A warrior for myself, a warrior for Mega One, and most importantly, a warrior for God. Alan hoped they had received his message, that they had to be warriors for God and not meek pseudo-Christians. Thus wouldn't they find their own strength just as he had? And why would he have ever kept something like that to himself, hoarded it like an evil man? If you saw someone drowning, wouldn't you throw them afloat? Of course you would. Just in case, though, he slid the sword back into its spot behind the driver's seat, turned around, and said, I don't understand what you two are up to, because that was the honest truth. Father looked up from his sneakers, which he noted were really getting worn down. Then Father looked at Jay, who was already looking at Father. That did it. They had an excuse, though, and made it seem as if they were laughing more at themselves than Alan, laughing for the obvious ridiculousness of their mission. And hadn't Alan just pointed that out? Alan wasn't laughing. Honestly, why are you doing this, this trip? He realized then, in the face of Father's and Jay's smiles and crinkled eyes, that they hadn't, he would have to be ridiculously obvious. He shook his head. I showed you the sword because it is something I earned after coming into my power. Well, not power. He reconsidered and looked down. My purpose. And you have it too, don't you see? As Christians, as warriors for God. Father stopped laughing and said, What do you mean, Alan? I don't understand. And what? It was then Alan's turn to laugh, which was more like a single burst of air, for wasn't it just like the lost to not understand, to need it laid out as clear as day, or as you call it, talking to drug addicts and prostitutes and non-believers as if you could be friends with them, as if that's what they needed? Here he stopped and sighed heavily into the ocean air. He turned around and again pulled out the sword from behind the seat of his stout, unsheathed it, and said a little too loudly, They need this. He froze with the sword raised to his face, perpendicular to, cement, to the cement parking lot. He slowly lowered it. They need to understand the power of the Lord, the power of damnation. Sorry to have to say it, but it's what it is. For the wages of sin is death. And Megan one, by the way, is simply the best way to keep your bodies healthy and holy, the temples of God. He stopped and seemed to shift gears momentarily. I can tell you more about it if you want. Father lost his smile, rosy post laugh hue. When Alan noticed this, he began to feel more confident, as if he were winning the two over. Oh, but you two know this, I know. It's just that, that... He looked into Father's eyes, held them for the first time since he'd brought out the sword. This was the man, after all, who was dating his sister. 
You say you're acting in the name of Jesus, but you're not. You're playing games. There must have been an errant cloud crossing the pit of pit went dark as if a storm were coming. Father looked up at the sky and saw the single dark cloud make it through its dark center. At its edges, where the cloud was thinner and softer looking, the sun's light shone through as if under a lampshade. The last thing Father would do would give Alan the satisfaction of either him or Jay speaking first, giving credence to his overwhelming bullshit. But would Jay get it? Would he speak and relinquish, relinquish their upper hand? Listen, Alan, Jay said, as impossibly large raindrops began falling into their hair. Father looked at Jay and shook his head no. Jay looked back and didn't understand. Father felt the rain sliding down his scalp, would have loved it at any other time. The feeling of the rain under his hair reminded him of Indiana. I understand where you're coming from, Jay continued. The raindrops stopped as soon as they started and the cloud passed. Lemon-colored light washed across the cement again. But we don't see ourselves as playing games. That's the last thing we had in mind. Jay looked at Father again to see if he could find any camaraderie there, any chance that Father was going to step in. Jesus came into the world to change it because he loved it, loved it. You can't forget forgiveness, Alan. It's as solid in the theology as, as hell. And Jay wasn't sure what else to say, hoped that Alan would just let it go at that and they could all return to Main Street and eat a hot breakfast. Instead, Alan said, you don't get it. I thought you would. He said it quietly and demurely, as if he weren't holding a sword, now slack in his hand. Father was good with people, even though he felt and would continue to feel great isolation from them. Over the years, he almost loved them, on his bed that people hated them. The older he got, the more he and that was themselves. They were really cared for those people, the down and outs, and he always would. Mainly, though, over the course of the days, the mission had become a test he was giving God. If God would take care of him and Jay physically, work with him, Father, would touch those people, the loss could be found and that all sins could be forgiven. The mission would be the proof that redemption was possible. But also, meaning, spiritual meaning, yes, but also generally, that there was some kind of plan to it all, to life, which really was his unplanned birth, his mother's craziness, his father's death, his brother's suicide, his own partial attraction to whatever wasn't holy, his subsequent sense that there was no hope, no love in the world. So five days in, Father was beginning to feel weary of going up for his proof. I like to think, though, that there was love there, too. True, pure, selfless love. That he and Jay were indeed working in the spirit those few days in 67. And that if you'd been one of those fortunate enough to sit with them in conversation, then you would have seen it, too. Or if not the spirit exactly, then its closest equivalency, selfless adoration of the other. But at this moment with Alan, Father's fatigue, the unrecognized harbinger of all the coming decades of manic unhappiness, helped spur on the anger he always held like a dense nugget inside him. The anger over feeling unloved, unwanted, and unforgiven for sins he couldn't be quite sure of, but often felt pulsing inside like the residence of something evil. So it came as no surprise to him that when Alan said, come on, just come home with me, I'll cook you a big meal, he simply reached over, grabbed the sword from Alan's hand, and thrust it high into the sky. Father hadn't played football since freshman year of college, during which he had broken his ankle badly enough to not be able to play again. He would limp all the remaining years of his life. In fact, I can still hear it now, the shuffle, shuffle of him crossing the carpet. But he could still throw, had always been happy with his strength and coordination until the years before his death when he would grow rosy-faced, fat, and lethargic. The sword sailed over an orange VW bug and diagonally across a Honda Accord before falling and hitting the cement ground with a loud clatter. And then it did something no one was prepared for. It broke perfectly in two. Thank you.